Welcome to Cardiac Delusions. Our code today, normal echocardiography excludes pulmonary embolism. Is that true or false? Our patient is a 52-year-old female who presented to the ER by an attack of acute dyspnea of 5 hours duration. She had the history of hysterectomy one week ago. Her ECG showed sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 100 beat per minute and blood pressure was 120 over 70. The ER doctor asked for a bedside echo as he suspected pulmonary embolism based on the recent history of surgery. This echo was performed by the cardiology specialist who showed unremarkable study, so the doctor reassured the patient and discharged her based on the absence of features suggestive of pulmonary embolism. The problem is that the patient returned to the ER again after about 4 hours, but at that time she was severely distressed, sweaty, and blood pressure was 80 over 60 with heart rate 130 p per minute, and saturation came down to 81 percent. Of course, another echo was performed based on this clinical deterioration, and at that time it showed dilated right side of the heart and was Frank McConnell sign which was suggestive of high-risk pulmonary embolism as the patient here is presenting with hemodynamic instability. The decision was to start RTPA infusion immediately based on the feature of the echo, which is a thrombolytic infusion, and she had significant clinical improvement as her blood pressure came up, heart rate came down, and saturation came up. So the patient had pulmonary embolism from the start, but in the first visit, mostly she had low or intermediate risk pulmonary embolism, but in the second time she deteriorated to become high-risk pulmonary embolism, necessitating fibrinolytic infusion. So what was the error made with this patient? According to 2019 AAC guidelines of pulmonary embolism, the acute pulmonary embolism may lead to RV pressure overload and dysfunction, which can be detected by echo. The echo features may show enlarged right ventricle in the parsed and long axis view or in the apical four chamber with McConnell sign. It may show flattened interventricular septum in the parsed and short axis, distended IVC with diminished collapsibility, 6060 sign which includes the acceleration time across pulmonary valve and the estimated RV systolic pressure. Sometimes it may show mobile thrombus in the right side of the heart. It may show impaired RV function manifested as reduced TAPSI in the M mode and may show reduced S prime value to less than 9.5 cm per second using tissue Doppler. Presence of dilated right ventricle with moderate or severe TR in echo raises suspicion of pulmonary embolism in a patient with intermediate or high pretest probability. All of us know this piece of information, that's why in this condition, most of us is going to ask for CT pulmonary angiography. And some patients may show increased RV wall sickness and TR jet velocity extremely high beyond values compatible with acute pressure overloads, which may raise suspicion of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Take care that in patients with high risk pulmonary embolism, which indicates presence of signs of hemodynamic instability. In this case, the presence of hemodynamic instability and the unequivocal signs of RV pressure overload and echo justify the immediate use of reperfusion therapy without waiting CT angiography, which may be not available or sometimes it may take longer time, which of course increases the risk of death. So in this case, we go directly for reperfusion therapy. That's why the task force in 2019 recommended that in case of suspected high-risk pulmonary embolism, either bedside echo or emergency CT pulmonary angiography is recommended for diagnosis. And so if I use the echo and it showed me signs of RV strain, this can confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism without waiting for CT pulmonary angiography. So we can conclude that if a patient is having suspected high-risk pulmonary embolism based on the presence of hemodynamic instability, if the echo in this case is completely normal without any signs of RV strain, this excludes pulmonary embolism as a cause of hemodynamic instability, and it makes sense. If the patient is shocked due to pulmonary embolism, this should be reflected on the right side of the heart. So if the echo is completely normal, this excludes this possibility. But what if the patient is having low or intermediate risk pulmonary embolism, so the patient here is hemodynamically stable.
If the echo is normal without any signs of RV strain, still primary embolism is a possibility. That's why the task force used two separate algorithms. The first one for suspected embolism in a patient with hemodynamic instability. We can see here that the echo is the first line in diagnosis. If it doesn't show any signs of RV strain, so we need to search for other causes of shock. But if it shows signs of RV strain, in this case, I can use CT primary angiography, but if it is not immediately available or feasible, I can confirm the diagnosis of high-risk primary embolism and start thrombolytic infusion. But in case of patient without hemodynamic instability, so I suspect low or intermediate risk primary embolism, we can see here that we depend on D-dimer test and CT primary angiography in the process of diagnosis, but ECHO here doesn't have any role to confirm or exclude diagnosis. So what is the actual role of ECHO in this case? We know also from 2019 guidelines that risk stratification is very important to stratify the patient without hemodynamic instability into low risk or intermediate risk. So we need to assess the right ventricle by imaging method and the most important is the echocardiography plus the lab biomarkers like troponin which is indicated to stratify the patient into being low risk or intermediate risk. So we know now that role of echo is in risk stratification in absence of hemodynamic instability and the negative predictive value of a normal echo in this case is just 40 to 50 percent. This means that low risk and intermediate risk primary embolism may have unremarkable echocardiography but this shouldn't exclude pulmonary embolism as a probable diagnosis because it is common to have primary embolism with normal echo in absence of hemodynamic instability. So if we return to the code at the start of this video, it is completely wrong. Normal echo does not exclude primary embolism. It only excludes high risk primary embolism, in which case the patient is hemodynamically unstable, otherwise its role is in prognosis and risk stratification, and if I need to exclude this possibility, I need to go for CT primary angiography. So this drags us to the fact that normal echo, normal ECG, normal venous duplex, normal chest x-ray, and normal EBG all don't exclude pulmonary embolism. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait for the next cardiac delusion.